Thank you everybody for choosing this as your afternoon panel. The others will be available on um, the video feed later after this conference. I know it's always hard to choose. It's like getting to choose which is your favorite class to take in college. Um, I'm also going to pre-apologize. This particular topic can get into an alphabet soup of acronyms really quickly. I will discourage the, the panelists from doing that, but it's hard to you'd use up all your words just saying the acronyms out loud. Um, so if we get into a situation that you don't know what we're talking about, feel free to like raise your hand and we'll tell you <laughs> what that acronym means. And I'm just going to do a brief introduction uh, of my panelists here, and then they're going to have five minutes each to discuss why these topics are important to them. Um, key thing we're focusing on today is multi-stakeholder versus multilateral and all the lovely tiering effects that that has on internet governance. So to my left, Drew Mitnick is a policy counsel at Access Now, where he works domestically and internationally to defend human right protections and online security for users. He leads the Access Now work to improve individual protection and the establishment of cybersecurity norms. And when he sent this to me, I was like, I wish I could wake up every morning and know that my job was that clear. Like, I got it. You know, I know what I'm doing. I'm keeping the world safe for the internet and I'm going to try to get some cyber norms done. So next to Drew, we have um, Peter, and I'm never sure I'm pronouncing your last name right. Give it a try. Patelling? Well, the most. Okay. Is it like an, some, some trick I should learn so I know how to say it so the rest of the room knows how to say your last name? Fatelnik. Fatelnik. I think I'm going to have to become European. <laughs> uh, he is the minister counsel at the delegation of the European Union in the United States here in Washington. So he joined us last spring, I think. Indeed. This is his first state of the net, so let's hope it's a good one. Uh, he covers a wide portfolio of digital uh, economy policy from AI to 5G, privacy to cyber, from copyright to data governance policies, and before joining the delegation, Peter worked on a variety of digital policy in Brussels in the European Commission. And I want you to know in that description, he's being very nice to us because he does a lot of other things, but he knows I only care about the things that are digital. <laughs> he's probably gonna be dealing cars. I'm like, I don't know that. Um, Dr. Laura Donardis is, uh, she's at American University, so if you guys ever get the chance, she's just right up the street and somebody who's always fun to talk to. She's globally recognized as one of the most read scholars in internet governance, and that's where Laura and I met each other is when she was researching one of her books on internet governance. So she has been in this space for a very long time and has a great detailed knowledge. With the background in information and engineering, science, and technology studies, she is tenured professor at the School of Communications at American University in Washington, where she serves as faculty director to the Internet Governance Lab. Her six books include The Global War for Internet Governance. Um, she has a new book coming out this summer on the Internet of Things and Governance, and she's affiliated at the, at the Yale Law School of Information Society projects and previously served as the executive director. So if you have not encountered Laura before, she is somebody that you need to know in Washington. She's fantastic. Um, Steve Del Bianco. The, the tail end of my, the table here is the president of NetChoice. He is an expert on internet governance, online consumer protection, internet taxes, and has testified in Congress 25 times. So they consider him an expert too. Uh, Steve has been elected to the policy chair of the ICANN business constituency, where if you really want to talk acronyms, he could probably wrap them. Uh, and he has been, he had helped work ICANN get through the transition in Congress in 2016, where they gave up control of, I, the U.S. government gave up control of IANA, and it is now completely a global, global entity. So that is our panel. I'm going to start with Drew, if you will just kick us off. Sure. Thanks. And hi, everybody. Um, it looks like the weather is uh, not particularly nice at the moment, so thank you for, uh, for sticking around. Um, so I'm, I'm going to premise my comments uh, on the need to maintain the multi-stakeholder uh, nature of internet governance writ large. I mean, I think you're, I think perhaps given the, 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 um, the gravity of the challenges that we're now seeing when it comes to the internet, whether those be human rights violations, you know, the general instability, um, the, the threats to peace that we need to retreat into our individual units, whether that be government go establish policy at home by itself or companies to implement changes to their own, their own policies um, unilaterally, that I think, in fact, the reality is quite the opposite, that the nature of the, the depth of the challenges that we're seeing actually indicate the need to reinvigorate um, 
the multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance. And so um, I, I'd like to use an example from the experience that we, we have at Access Now. Um, one, of the, one of the projects that we, that we have been operating for the past few years is called Keep It On, where we're trying to identify internet shutdowns as they happen and try to educate the decision makers on the human rights impacts and the economic impacts of the shutdowns. And so just the past few weeks, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, the Z Zimbabwe government uh, ordered an internet shutdown. And it was based on protests over changes in fuel prices and the supposed need to quell the political speech in response to the change in, in fuel prices. Um, and thanks to quite a few years of work to establish definitions of what internet government, or excuse me, of what internet shutdowns are, to uh, bring the issue to the attention of uh, international organizations, um, you know, there was an effective response, and within three days, the Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe government uh, allowed the internet to be turned back on. And so that, the work that was done to establish those standards was not done in a vacuum. It wasn't done simply by Access Now, obviously. It wasn't done by any lone organization. It was done through collaboration. Um, and so I think the example speaks to the need uh, uh, to, continue, to continue to approach this work uh, collectively. I think there are, there, you know, you can look out there and see any number of examples that, uh, that re kind of de continue to demonstrate the same need. So right now, Venezuela, for example, <coughs> is considering cybersecurity bill. And I think only through international pressure can we identify the censorship harms and perhaps the harms that the governments, or excuse me, the companies that operate in Venezuela will feel if, if the legislation actually becomes law. Um, one of the things that I know was in the description of the event in particular was the Paris call, which was an agreement that was reached during the Internet Governance Forum in Paris the end of last year. Uh, and the Paris call was an attempt to articulate a number of norms that the stakeholders that ultimately agreed to the, the call could identify as, uh, as collective interests and priorities. And so Access Now uh, participated in, the, in, some of the, in crafting some of the language behind the call, as well as the French government and, and a number of companies. Ultimately, uh, over 500 organizations signed on to the Paris call. Um, and that included you know, Microsoft, Ericsson, uh, a, a, a slew of companies. It also included governments as diverse as Qatar, Japan, a number of EU, of EU governments as well. Uh, perhaps one notable absence was the US government. But uh, it, I think it was a, a demonstration that despite the magnitude of the challenge we face, there are a lot of entities out there in the world who agree on some fundamental principles that should be prioritized over the next few years. So one example that we, we found particularly important within the Paris call was uh, the, the inclusion of language on coordinated vulnerability disclosure, which essentially says that it's, a, it's the collective responsibility of the tech, the tech companies, the security researchers, the governments who discover vulnerabilities to then uh, create a process so that they can be remediated and, the, and the, 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 the gaps that are the basis for cybersecurity attacks can be resolved. And th that is the kind of issue that, that uh, is only going to be addressed if there continues to be this, this collaboration. Um, in addition to the US not being there, Russia and China were not on the Paris call as well. And so I think there's become this sense of uh, this is a matter of Russia and China and, and like-minded countries versus European countries, the US perhaps, and others. And, and while that's true to some degree, you know, the, the principles that are being prioritized at internet governance events and through these processes, through, like the Paris call, are also about responding to what we would identify as the harms that arise out of even, even European and American policy making. Um, so um, it's to say that, that there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that this concept of collaboration and multi-stakeholderism continues to be the primary method by which internet governance uh, and policy making happens. I think we'll see it throughout 2019. I mean, one good example is at the UN, there are actually two 
competing processes to establish cybersecurity norms. One process is called the Group of Governmental Experts. The other one is the Open Ended Working Group. It's not really that important to identify the processes, but one of the processes emphasizes state sovereignty more, where the other process puts more emphasis on, on multi-stakeholderism. Multi so, um, you know, I think it's important, while this is somewhat of a vague concept, for, for those of us who care about the future of the internet to ensure we're working on it collaborative and, collaboratively and toward common goals. And moderator prerogative, since I have the statistics. Um, it was 100 NGOs, 50 countries, and I don't have the con companies. I thought it was 60 off the top of my head. Uh, just to give you an idea how many people were on the Paris call. But we will get into that here in a minute. Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> to a certain extent, my introduction will kind of mirror what you said already. And I uh, will use different words, will come from a different angle, but it's still the same story we, we are going to tell here. I, I would like to use two metrics to get started. The one is that I think internet governance for me is this technical or organizational rules which underpin a technology served to 3.9 billion people on the planet. This year is the first time where it's more than half the planet the internet is, is reaching and serving. And I guess it's safe to assume the rest is going to come one day. Uh, at the same time, the internet today, what makes it really interesting, it became mobile. And mobility brings it so close to you, brings it closer to you than your friends and your family. The internet <coughs> sits within your ears these days. And it's not difficult to see that, in particular, author authoritarian governments realize that that connection bears some risk. And this is where the concerns with internet governance come from. If a technology has that access to you and cannot be, I don't want to use the word controlled, but you know, and government cannot closely understand how that relationship works, they have concerns. It's almost independent what government, government I'm talking about, but authoritarian governments are particular prone, and the examples you have brought, I think, speak for themselves. So there is that aspect. The second one is, the economic growth behind it, which is almost now, I've been talking about government and the relation to internet. There's an economic growth underpinned by, by this internet. Just the United States alone exported digital services worth $185 billion in 2016 to Europe alone. And this is going to increase. So our Global commerce is built on this technology, yet another driver, which is very important for government to understand, how can I benefit from that? What risk does it pose it to me? And if you're an authoritarian government, you bring other elements into this conversation. <coughs> so it is obvious that every nation state has its own understanding of what internet governance is. This is where we are today. And this is why I can fully subscribe to the view of true that multi-stakeholderism is the only mechanism we have to keep this business rolling, to, have to keep conversations going. Now, multi-stakeholderism can, and we can dive into this term, you, know, you have used United Nations, whether that is the right forum, whether this forum, uh, like, like uh, I'm not sure, I'm fishing for words now, whether we look at fora where like-minded countries more get together, because we have to be also then clear on what is important to us as a Western Western-style society. What does Europe want? What does the United States want? They do drive a bit of the majority of, of decision-making in this area for the moment worldwide. And, and we also have to understand who, who are other actors and where they want to go and how do we bind them into this conversation. I don't think that I mean, the internet today is fragmented. That time was long over many years ago and we didn't notice it happened. It is already. So the point is not of going back to a situation 20 years ago. The point is going forward to a situation where all these trade-offs can work out in a way we are kind of happy with. That this delivers citizen value, economic value, it functions technically, the cyberspace is kept in check, or cybersecurity is kept in check. I, I don't want to go f very far, but I wanted to ask as well why the United States has not subscribed to, to the Paris call. And I think there's one of the, the elements in there. We have to agree on the values and on the principles, and then not to, need to do nitty-gritty on, on some of the, of the wording and the text, whether the French translation and the German translation is correct. 
I, th I think if we, if we are stuck on the detail, we will not move that conversation very much. And, and m maybe it will take another few years to get us out of that sort of, well, I'm right, you're right, and this is right, and that is wrong. But one, sh one thing, and I close here, one thing for sure, in all these conversations we are having while we are speaking, trust in the internet is going down the drain. It is very low, it is too low, definitely far too low for a technology which is delivering this great societal and economic value. And we all know that usage doesn't mean trust. So we have to work on the trust. That means Paris call, cybersecurity, but it also means this multi-stakeholderism, getting that conversation back going. I promise we'll come back to several of those topics. Laura. It has been really interesting over the last decade or 15 years to see how a collection of issues around internet governance has transformed from being interesting only to a handful of policymakers <laughs> and academics and the technology community to now being in, on the front burner of the G20. It has been really interesting to see. Obviously, that's because the internet has become a strategic resource, both economically and socially. But it also is because control over the internet's infrastructure has become a proxy for state power. This is true from social control, to censorship, to um, cyber war, to uh, trying to compete on the global stage. But underneath all of these political and policy discussions, there still is a technical infrastructure. I'm stating the most obvious aspect, um, obvious to us, but sometimes people don't see that there's an infrastructure underneath content in applications and devices. And the term internet governance has been one that has long been meant to convey this administration of the technologies that are necessary to keep the internet operational and then the enactment of policy around these technologies. There's been a great myth of internet governance that we see carrying forward into the policy discussions, and that's thinking about it as one thing. So internet governance is actually a collection of many different tasks that keep the internet operational. Uh, I'll try not to use any acronyms, but it includes the administration of domain names and numbers, it includes interconnection coordination, it includes standard setting, it includes cybersecurity governance, it includes the policy making role of private intermediaries. So it's not one thing. There are many actors, which is why we usually call it multi-stakeholder governance, private sector, new global institutions, governments, and sometimes civil society. Um, now, this balance um, has done a fairly good job of keeping the internet operational, even though there is fragmentation, as discussed. But a few years ago, I got together with Ambassador David Gross and Gordon Goldstein, and we, we wrote a paper on cyber sovereignty, much of which has come to fruition now. The paper is about these two clashing worldviews, and I'm not one to use binaries, but I think in this case it may be appropriate. One view envisions the internet uh, generally supporting the free flow of information, generally distributing control over many stakeholders in this multi-stakeholder approach, and uh, historically this has been the dominant model. The competing vision seeks bordered state administration of the internet in the name of sovereignty and greater control. And China and Russia and other countries interested in greater control over content have espoused this. And I would say there is a huge difference between the way that China and Russia approach the internet and the way the US and uh, Western democracies approach it. Just ask any LGBT person about that and they'll answer that question. So these visions are not just discourses but they involve policy choices with tangible effects, not only on foreign policy and expression and the digital economy, but on the internet itself. Um, and I would also like to mention that this, there's a long history of this. This isn't something that's cropping up now. Um, you, if you look at the historical trajectory, you see it in um, the discussions about interconnection regulation that cropped up at the ITUs, uh, I'm gonna use an acronym, sorry, the WICIT, the World Conference on International Telecommunications, you see it in um, the rise of data localization laws. You see it in the increasing use of local redirection in the domain name system uh, to policies in Cuba and Iran and elsewhere that seek to censor 
information. And uh, the Zimbabwe case is an extreme example of this. And you, you even see it in the, the, the pursuit or the look to um, multilateral uh, solutions to some of the problems that exist right now. So this changing narrative from the multi-stakeholder model, it's not multi-stakeholder in every area of technical governance, but you know, in, in total, cumulatively, there are all these actors involved across the different functional classes. This uh, move from that to cyber sovereignty and greater multilateral uh, approaches, it actually is a sea change. Many of these uh, solutions that are being espoused under the name of cyber sovereignty tamper with the technical infrastructure of the internet for these political objectives having nothing to do with keeping it operational. And while laws apply within national borders, it's also important to say that the way information flows on the internet does not comport with national borders, especially at the logical level. Uh, layers. So what happens in one country can have cascading effects that can have effects in others. All of these uh, approaches to tampering with the infrastructure can also complicate cybersecurity, which is, in my opinion, the great human rights issue of our time because it's necessary for securing democracy, the economy, and for securing consumer rights. So the policy uh, discussions that are you know, emanating from these trends are very real. That's why I think it's important that we're having this panel. And they often uh, fail to consider, in some ways, because they don't see the infrastructure, they fail to consider the effects on the infrastructure. This will even be uh, heightened to a greater extent in terms of exploiting facial recognition, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things. So while the world is distracted by um, amorphous norms discussions, there are tangible debates. These are over real infrastructure that are now the real proxy for political power. Thank you. Thank you for adding a lot more things to our discussion <laughs> that we, we're going to tackle them. Steve. Thanks, Shane. Unique among the panelists here, I run a trade association of businesses. And uh, our mission is simple. We want to make the internet safe for free enterprise and free expression. But lately, the last few years, that's become mission impossible both here and abroad. And this is the 15th year of State of the Net. And I have to ask myself, how did we come to this? Because 15 years ago, we had a huge uh, disruption as the internet enabled the disruption of control exercised by governments and the control exercised by large incumbent businesses. Think about the taxi industry, the hotel industry, uh, retailers, and, ho and uh, uh, even newspapers and big media. That disruption 15 years ago led to this whole theme that talked about free flow of information. But 15 years later, I would have to say to you that governments and big businesses have regained their footing and are reasserting control. That is resulting in a balance of power that hasn't been present lately. The question is, how far will that balance swing? Will the pendulum swing way past neutral into a situation where we get multilateralism and some of the ills that Laura and the others have discussed? I think what it shows is that with regard to the internet, we fit the old rule that success doesn't get you friends, it just gets you a better class of enemies. Thanks. So the question that Shane put to us was discussion of a global order for the internet. And I have to suggest to you that is another mission impossible. There might be aspirations for global values, but they are going to get crushed by sovereignty concerns and real politique. We've mentioned the Paris call, and I was there in Paris when this happened. Let me quote to you the part of the Paris call that all of us agreed with is that the Internet has become central to almost every aspect of human existence, check, and the threat, the main threat, is cyber attacks by state and non-state actors, which threaten individuals in the free flow of commerce and information. Who wouldn't sign up to that kind of norms? Well, part of it is because President Macron followed the Paris call with a 45-minute speech at the Internet Governance Forum at 5 o'clock Monday that afternoon, where he interpreted it somewhat differently, although this is an English translation. He said, we must defend against the excesses of the Internet. So the excesses of the Internet, that's music to the ears of Russia and China and any regime. He said, platforms are directing content to users that brings them dangerous ideas. Dangerous ideas. He said, we could allow all voices to express online, but in the name of these universal values, we should not. 
because too much liberty will endanger universal values. This is Macron. In the final excerpt, he said, I heard murmurs in the room, because he's speaking extemporaneously, when I say that we need to regulate the internet in order to keep it free. He said, but listen, not all governments are equal. Some liberal democracies are just better. So with a speech t teed up like that, there's no wonder when you turn to Davos last week, we heard Germany say that, well, when it comes to geopolitical order, no, Germany has their own way of interpreting privacy through GDPR, and they have their own methods of imposing obligations on platforms for hate speech. We heard China say that they would use their own rules when it comes to free expression. And we know that businesses have become adept at pursuing uh, mercantilist policies to advantage themselves with national government policies. But I don't want to be entirely negative, because I want to fondly recall uh, the light-touch regulatory environment that enabled the internet innovation in communications, peer-to-peer -peer commerce and, commun and uh, sharing of ideas, and also the access to knowledge, how the internet has enabled anyone with a browser to get access to so much of the world's store of knowledge. How did we get there? Think back 15, 20 years. A number of you in the room were there at the creation, but the Clinton administration in 98 said, let's commercialize and internationalize the governance of the internet. And they started with ICANN. Uh, we had Section 230, which was a piece of the Communications Decency Act that said that platforms are not strictly liable for the content and commerce of people that use the platform. And that is what gave birth to the peer-to-peer -peer revolution. We also had privacy laws that were based on consumer harms, not just feeling creepy, but consumer harms. Two more, we have a consumer welfare standard when it comes to the application of antitrust laws. We look to see whether a bigness and behavior on a large company is hurting consumers, not whether it hurts competitors. And finally, we have a physical presence standard, or at least we used to, when it came to the taxation of cross-border activity. I guess that went away in June of last year when the Supreme Court threw out the Quill case, and that's been followed by an advent of new laws which reach across borders to impose taxation. So as we move away from that original state, that original environment that created the internet, if we move away from that in the US and in the rest of the world, we are going to see an increase in barriers to entry and a decrease in innovation. And only the largest internet firms, who are among my members, are going to be able to afford the costs and complexities of compliance. And even so, they will make mistakes frequently. And those mistakes will generate a calls for even greater regulation and even greater barriers to entry. Uh, the, the question I would have is, will the citizens, those of us in this room and in different countries, are we just going to sit still and let them boil the frog of internet innovation? Or do we feel the burn, each in our own way, and seek a return to a freer time? Uh, that's a question that will be answered within each country, within each culture. Because as I said earlier, there won't be a geopolitical order. That's a myth. So nor will there be a geopolitical uh, consistency at trying to return to the free internet we gave birth to here 15 or 20 years ago. Thank you. We'll put a lot on our plate. Thank you. Um, you know, for those of you who have not spent as much time on the Paris call, you know, it's one of those documents that at, at top level, at you, it's very agreeable, and so it's always interesting to hear what people pull out of it, that one of the core parts is the rights of people to have, the rights that they have offline for them to have online. And uh, Peter Singer from New America commented that part of the reason why he saw um, the embracing uh, the, the companies, you know, going towards this is they were they have a very big part in defending cybersecurity, and so they want to be part of this. And this agreement, in part, is a reaction to the lack of government activity in this space, to Peter's earlier point about how we can't even get in the room, let alone have the discussion. Um, one of, and, and you know, so we've, we've, we've had a lot of interesting points of view on this. And Laura, I kind of hear you saying that it may have very laudable goals, but there's a lot of it's a shiny object um, that is pulling away from other things that maybe some of these governments are trying to do at the same time so we don't pay attention to it. I have a feeling like I should even ask a question. There might be some responses you guys want to do for each other on this. Because I know that, I think you're all here with the best of intentions, but you don't all agree that the intention's the same. Do you think that we're all talking about the same problem? No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Peter, you can go first. Um, and I will keep it short because there may be many things I may slightly disagree with. But, but one is, you know, as... Uh, 
sovereignty means there is a set of rules on a territory. And in Europe, we have a constitution, uh, a charter of fundamental rights for the citizens. This is constitutional rights. I mean, how, how can anybody have a conversation whether they should be or they should not be? They are constitutional. It's like uh, similar to here. Uh, I think uh, questioning the constitution is maybe more an academic conversation than a practical conversation for lawmakers because you're not going to change it immediately quickly. And many of the things in Europe you see, like GDPR, the right on privacy, a lot of what you see in internet governance, and what you will see on artificial intelligence comes from that, from that chart of fundamental rights, which guarantees privacy to every human or every citizen of the European Union, and dignity. These are, these are concepts which are probably more modern in our conversation, which simply is the fact that our constitution is just uh, six years old in its, old, in its latest version. So, so, but I, I think we have to get over those points. There's no point of having a conversation about privacy. There isn't. We can have, and I appreciate, and I will happily explain and whatsoever, but it's a constitutional right at the end of the day, and, it's, and it is there, it's there to stay. So we can talk about certain elements, the implications of that. What does it mean? What are technical solutions? Does it stifle innovation? Probably, probably not. We don't know yet. So there are many of these conversations which I'm much more interested than in the, in the sort of super high level saying, yeah, well, everybody should be doing as I like it. But here I stop. Steve looks like he'd like to respond to that. Peter, Peter I'd love to engage on that because one of the strangest parts of Europe's interpretation of its rights is this thing called the right to be forgotten because it clashes. It creates this dignity and privacy right, but it says that Europeans don't actually have a right to know about material information that has happened and been published, but they don't want search engines to be able to retrieve it. In five years, the right to be forgotten has resulted in a million links being stripped out of search engines so that those search engines couldn't access the underlying information that had already been published. Fully 20% of those million links that had to be stripped away were stripped from news sources, where a news source might have had a very critical article of an athlete or actor's performance. Or just last week, news and websites that reported on certain doctors who had their licenses revoked. And the lawyer for those doctors was successful on appeal at getting the right to be forgotten to force the search engines, Google and others, to strip that away. So if I'm searching for information on that doctor, I don't know that she's had her license revoked. And she subsequently had it partially restored I mean, I'd like to know both pieces of information, but under right to be forgotten, what Europe has done is teed up one right against another and relying on individual court decisions to figure out how to balance the rights. But Peter, it is all about balancing rights, the rights for me to ex freely express, the rights for me to innovate and create something. All of those typically clash. And I don't, I don't think it's even honest to suggest that you've got it all figured out and that Europe's rights are fundamental, universal, and ought to be applied everywhere. Lord, Lord do you want to, since he was talking about the broken links, can you kind of talk about what that happens with the technology? Is there a knock-on effect when we start to not agree with how these, like a search engine should be operating, and there's now separate rules by geographic region? I think the fundamental issue under that is that um, in every single area of internet governance, and again, we're discussing a lot of them all in the same panel here, there's always a, uh, always conflicting values. So, you know, at the, at the values level, uh, like one person's privacy is another person's censorship, for example. On the other hand, it's impossible to think about a democracy without the possibility of private conversations between citizens. You have law enforcement, uh, responsibilities that we want versus privacy. So it's all, um, you know, the issue of balance in where that lies is the, the question. However, when you get into the technology of it and you start making changes, so what happened, we've seen this, uh, we've seen something happen local, locally that takes down other parts of the internet, for example. Um, the most uh, well-publicized example of that, I think, was when in Pakistan, when they um, redirected, they were blocking something, and it ended up getting picked up in the routing um, advertisements around the world and took down, I believe it was Google. This was quite a while ago. These, 
of you, you, Google's YouTube, right. So this, this happens uh, time and time again, where you have the, and the same thing with uh, data localization. See, the reason it, it, it's very difficult to implement something locally is because the way the information flows crosses borders. In many countries, they don't even have an internet exchange point. So it has to go through Europe in order to come down to Africa in some cases. So that's, um, that's why I always like to bring up the technology of the internet, because um, even though law applies and culture and norms apply in a certain case, it, the, the technology, uh, at least at the logical layer, does not map onto it. So it, there are cascading effects sometimes. <clears throat> uh, you know, I think, uh, I think in addition to, um, in addition to perhaps having variable laws between countries, there's, there are also instances where um, the failure to, to, to implement a law in one place can mean, uh, can mean that we haven't yet caught up to perhaps what a, a global understanding of of these values, or, or the development of, of, the, uh, of these values. So for example, uh, when, when we think about privacy, I think intrinsically we consider privacy to include the privacy in relation to companies that might collect our personal information. And that isn't necessarily protected under the US Constitution, although, as has been pointed out, protection exists under, under EU human rights law. And so I think another demonstration of where the fracturing has occurred is the lack of, uh, of a law or a regime in the US to protect personal data in relation to some of the harms that are felt based on company collection is that the, the protection of EU person's data does not extend, it does, it does not under law extend to the US territory. And it has created this, uh, it has created this re regime called Privacy Shield, which um, is, is based on somewhat of a flawed premise that the US provides essentially equivalent protection uh, as EU law. And so I think in addition to needing to uh, see some level of uniformity between, between different countries' laws, there is also the need to have this conversation about how do we, uh, as you know, within the US, how do we perhaps satisfy what I think we would intrinsically say is our natural understanding of, of what privacy even means. So um, Prime Minister Shino Abe last week after Davos came out and said that um, Japan is hosting the next G20, that he wanted the main focus to be data governance. Um, and I think that gets a little bit to our vocabulary challenge that we were talking about is, you know, some one person's privacy is another person's data. Um, and are we going are we going towards norms? Because I know that norms are kind of important in some of these discussions. Or is this another shiny object, Laura? What do, what, what do we think about that? And, you know, this is going to be a topic in five months. Are we ready for it? I think there'll be no shortage of conversations about it, uh, you know, because many of the key issues around speech, around privacy and reputation and, of, of course, intellectual property are at that level of, of data. But it's, it also um, instantly cuts out uh, n the stability and security of the infrastructure. So when you're talking about data, so that, that leaves out, in some cases, uh, many layers of standard setting. It leaves out um, interconnection coordination. It leaves out um, uh, issues around routing and addressing. It leaves out the domain name system, except at the domain level. So I don't know if data governance is the right word for it, um, but I do think that it will be a way to, it, it speaks to that issue of the interest has been um, at this level of discussion in regulating content. And I think using the term data governance, it captures that interest. Steve, I'll get to you in a second, but Peter, I, I'm hoping you're going to jump in on this, because it sounds to me in your opening comments, this was a little bit of what you were saying is, if we can't get to some of the high-level discussions, if we, if we let, and not everything that Laura just mentioned is very important, but if we let the lower levels of the technology decide the higher level of the policy, that we will never, ever get anywhere in this conversation. I don't want to, I'm putting words in your mouth, so yeah, am yes, I, are they do, accurate? Yeah. Okay, or am I, correct me. Well, you know, if... If a country wants internet links underlined in green instead of blue, so <laughs> be it. You know, they can have any color they want. So that, you know, we shouldn't get stuck on, on, on sort of technical, technology can do anything we want, in particular today. You know? so, so we shouldn't be sort of like, oh, this cannot be done technologically. Yes, it can be. Yes, it will not be for free, I agree. 
So I think there comes the economic element and what industry wants all into that, but that's a balance at the end of the day. If we were to have, you know, just follow that logic of the regulation stifles innovation, we wouldn't have any regulation, and we do have plenty. So, so I think it is the balance question. What I like with the G20, and if I may add a word mm -hmm. on that, is if I read the documents, uh, and I understand the written document actually refers very much to non-personal data. I mean, personal data is, you know, we have had a conversation already, it's one group of data, but there's the huge kingdom of non-personal data. This could be business data, this are research data, this are pseudonymized health data, these are open data by governments. So there are kingdoms of other data, sources of other data, which we can exploit. And I think he was going very much into this direction of, here is where G20, a group of, of, of like-minded countries in, in this area, can do really a lot. And if we agree on technologies, on standards, on the usage and boosting that, that would already be great. We don't have to solve the hardest problem first. We probably can solve that last. And I think that's what I liked in his approach of, this is something achievable. Industry is behind it, uh, governments are behind it, so let's try to find what would be uh, what technical ways to underpin that free flow of data among the G20 or maybe perhaps beyond that. I promised the mic to Steve and then Laura, you can go next. Steve, you still want in here? Yeah, Prime Minister Abe talks about data governance. And remember, govern governments retain the ability to govern what their citizens see what they do and what they say. They, governments can regulate that. They can put people in jail, whether it happened over the internet, over the telephone, or the television. So none of that has changed, but data governance is a very convenient way for nations to justify economically beneficial activities that they want to pursue. I'll give you just two examples where you can follow the money. One is data localization, and a number of other panelists have mentioned it as well. In the name of data governance and protecting my citizens' privacy, I'll require that their data can't be kept in servers in California. They've got to be kept here domestically, in Indonesia, in Brazil, in China, in Russia. That data localization is an economic nationalism policy, since it brings that data and the expense of maintaining it to that nation's economic development. Another is this notion that the data and images that are shown to European eyes is an activity that the Europe's want to be able to tax. The digital services tax is a way of governing the data that crosses the Atlantic and shows up on the screens and cell phones of Europeans. And if that is subject to a 4% tax, as Spain, Italy, France are trying to accomplish right now, that is what happens when you allow the governance of data across borders in a way that countries can use it for whatever purpose they want, and it often involves their own economy and their own treasury. Laura? If I could only make one point in this entire discussion, it would be the following. It's not that data and content issues are political, and then all the stuff underneath it is just technical. The point of my uh, statements is that the technology is political in and of itself. So if you're just looking at content, and yes, that's, there are many, many important issues to look there. It's not just about, you know, if I may, the, the color of the link and things like that. Um, it, it's a matter of, um, like, if someone is disabled, how do they access information? It has to be designed into the standards. That's political. Um, if someone wants to um, know that they're getting a transaction in their bank that's authentic, it's, that has to do with the public key cryptography. So that's about the digital economy and about people's individual rights. Um, with the Internet of Things, it's, there's data that doesn't pass through people at all. It's the ambient things around us that have to be secured. And now, um, instead of um, you know, sabotaging content, we could sabotage the brakes in a car. So to me, those are human rights issues, and I just, I just want to encourage discussions of internet governance to focus on the data and the content, but also those other layers that are very important for human rights. Thank you. And Drew, you had mentioned that you are concerned that this can't take place just at a multilateral point of view. We need to have the multi-stakeholder process engaged. Do you want to elaborate on that? Sure, yeah, and, and just thinking about what Laura just said, I, you know, we... Um, so we operate a, um, a conference every year called RiceCon that I think has become part of the broader internet governance landscape and it, it aims to bring together civil society and 
um, academics and government and, and companies. And um, one good example of where I think we were aiming to achieve what you were just talking about is we had a conversation about artificial intelligence. And it wasn't simply how do we regulate artificial intelligence. It was actually we had the standard setting bodies as part of that conversation. We had obviously civil society and the human rights interests involved because you know that's, that's our own background. But then we also had um, companies and we had governments there as well. And, and the goal was really just to establish some level of principles. Ultimately, we were looking specifically at um, non-discrimination under artificial intelligence and machine learning. But I think um, that I think that process was for us very valuable to illustrate that there that these issues do transcend the layers of the internet, and it also transcends the different stakeholders that are involved. And hopefully, now once you know there is any aim to actually regulate, if that's ultimately the decision, artificial intelligence, we have perhaps a, a slightly better common understanding of what the issues actually are. So we're at the ten minute mark, and I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, do we have? Do we have a mic? Yes. Okay. Thank you for answering that. Um, if you want to identify yourself and if you care to have an organizational identification, you can do that too. Questions from the audience? If not, this group can go for another hour. Hi, I'm Adam Thier with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. So my question to the panel is, what's next after multilateralism and multi-stakeholderism? Because even though some of us still like to think wishfully, hopefully about the future incorporating a multilateral, multi-stakeholder approach. Some of us have also come to the conclusion that it's not going to work anymore and that we may be entering more of maybe a bilateral world. There's some people, some scholars have called it a neo-medieval world where we have smaller and smaller units of government making decisions for the internet. And it is bordered off or federated internet as some people have called it. I mean, are, is there a backup plan here? Or is it just doubling down on the same old model of the past, which, I mean, hey, I've written books and papers out the kazoo on this and said it's great. But it doesn't sound to me, just from what Peter and Steve are saying on this panel, that it can work anymore, right? The First Amendment and the right to be forgotten cannot work together. We can't even agree with the Europeans on these things. And then we've got Chinese, Russian interests, and everybody else. So what's the backup plan? Is it, is it bilateral negotiated standards? Is it some sort of regionalized approach? What's, what's next? Maybe there'll be a free market approach. Instead of going to Florida for the winter, you'll go to where you like their internet laws the best. <laughs> Adam, uh, thanks for the great work you do on permissionless innovation. And uh, I, I would love to return to those days, but, but they are gone. Uh, I think it's now necessary to ask permission rather than beg forgiveness when it comes to innovation. And that gives rise to the, the best answer to your question is that we are already well past multi-stakeholder and multilateral, and we're in an atmosphere of battling bilaterals. Uh, France, wanting to enforce its right to be forgotten, is seeking a court ruling to force those search engines based here in the US to not even return an answer that could be seen by those French eyes if somebody wants to check out whether a doctor is licensed. Uh, GDPR is exporting the Europe, European concept and financial penalties for privacy violations across borders, since it applies no matter in the where in the world. If you're affecting the data of a European resident who may not even be in Europe at the time, you're susceptible. So inevitably, the US and France and Europe are going to have to work out bilateral arrangements, because we can't have this escalating battle where we block their content and they block ours. That doesn't serve anyone's interests. So I, I'm afraid we are already past uh, the best of both worlds and moving toward an area where saner heads are going to have to prevail. We work out things like safe harbors, reciprocity in bilateral arrangements, and perhaps a limited scope of multilateral. Anyone else want to take that question on? Plan B is always called the future. So there is always a plan B, but it's going to come in the future one day. <laughs> I, I think I didn't see what you said very much as a question, rather as a comment, frankly, to which I can sympathize a lot. However, I want to, at that stage as well say, you know, Europe is committed to this multi-stakeholderism. The IGF conference, the ITU-IGF conference, has been held in Geneva, Paris, and it's going to be this year in Berlin. These governments have taken this onus upon them to organize and make it happen. 
So I think this is clearly a visible sign that Europe is interested in this conversation. And not necessarily leading it, but being around the table having these conversations. So I think this is also an invitation to all of you to turn up in Berlin 25th of November and, and be part of that conversation. Question right there. Uh, Mike Nelson. One of the stakeholders that don't tend to come to the high profile meetings like the Internet Governance Forum or the OECD or the UN meetings is the intelligence community. They might how, be, how do you know that? <laughs> well, I was going to say, they might be there, but they stand up and say, I'm Fred, I'm with the US government. Right. But they almost never stand up, and they don't engage. And they go off to their own meetings of the Five Eyes that was recently held in Australia, for instance. How would you engage the intelligence community, which is shaping a lot of the ways in which governments approach the internet? But they don't talk about their strategy, that we don't know what's really going on. How, how would you make sure we really do get all the different players? And, and how would you change surveillance policy for the next phase of the internet? That's a whole other topic for another panel. But you know, you've opened the can of worms, so does anybody want to dive in? Sure. Yeah, I'll take a, a, a real quick stab at it. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you raised a good point, Mike. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that we saw happen at the end of the last year, so we were talking earlier about, you know, Try it in Russia versus perhaps the EU and US as a differentiation. But right, right at the end of the year last year, Australia passed what, passed what I would say is a pretty regressive uh, anti-encryption law that'll, that would uh, require companies to make changes to their platforms to ensure intelligence access without even the possibility of uh, alerting their user base that they were making the change. And, and in my mind, that's something that looks a little bit more like what you would expect from China or Russia than you would from European countries. And certainly the lack of engagement with uh, intelligence agencies, I think, is, you know, have to, to contribute to the conversations about the human rights implications of those, those kind of laws is a very serious challenge. I mean, I think now, I, you know, I think, it, I think it does speak to the need to continue to create multi-stakeholder pressure. So, for example, in the context of Australia, you know, perhaps having that conversation about what is, what are the implications for the companies operating there? You know, what is their decision? What is their decision like? You know, how how can we how can we more visibly demonstrate the human rights harms and the security harms that might arise out of that legislation? So, even if the intelligence agencies aren't aren't coming to the table to have the conversation, at least making it very clear what the potential damage or the felt damages of the decisions that we made based on based on you know their their beliefs. Laura? Sometimes when I'm in a room of like-minded experts, every time we talk about freedom or speech or privacy, we call it the internet. And then whenever <laughs> we're talking about intelligence or security, we sometimes call it, we, we, not sometimes, we switch to cyber. Right. And this <laughs> is absurd. We're, you know, you're talking about the same exact technologies. So I think one solution lies in uh, solving that terminology problem. I'm not sure how to do it. But it, that, that is a very important point that Mike um, raises. I personally engage a lot with the intelligence community. I certainly did as part of the Global Commission on Internet Governance when I was involved as research director. But uh, I think that some of the newer technologies might be the arena where, the, uh, where everyone can come together. So when you think about the IoT, for example, and the shift of the internet from a communication network to a control network that connects more things uh, than people, I think that we'll have to come together in the different communities because of the stakes of that. Another question up front? Tech support. Yeah. All right. um, thank you very much, uh, Zviad and Zimbaya. I've recently worked, uh, completed my uh, tenure at the European Parliament, could see the difference between uh, Europeans and um, Americans there, um, focusing on disinformation. So my question pertains to e internet online voting, um, i-voting, which Estonia champions now globally. Uh, so what do you think is the future of um, e-voting? How could United States or the rest of Europe leverage this um, in terms of perhaps increasing electoral participation, especially in the people who are digitally savvy but are not very democratically engaged. Thank you. Steve? I think it's very promising to look at the <coughs> convenience, 
transparency and verifiability of votes that are recorded in a way that is easy to do and easy to verify. So a blockchain-based database, for instance, offers transparency, but that's going to clash with my right to privacy with respect to how I cast a ballot. So you've got to reconcile that transparency with preserving the anonymity of those who voted. And when you add anonymity, you decrease the ability to verify that exactly the right eligible people in a given precinct actually voted. When it comes to the Internet's participation in elections, the topic du jour is not how do I vote, but how are voters being influenced by misinformation, right, and uh, campaigns where state actors, as well as private actors, are using the Internet to spread disinformation and divide people. And that seems to me to be the major concern. It's one is which brought, it's brought a lot of politicization to an otherwise neutral platform. Shane uh, was a mentor of mine years ago, and what she rued the most was an idea that we would start to politicize the governance of the Internet through ICANN or IANA. Well, right now, we are politicizing peer-to-peer -peer platforms. We politicize what speech is allowed on Facebook, and we politicize the, the president's not happy with mostly negative news coming back in a search and wants to somehow compel or punish the search engines if they don't put his good news higher than the bad news. You know, even a country with a First Amendment knows that a government can exert power in a lot of other ways that aren't prohibited by the First Amendment. So I think the things in the elections are more at risk uh, with areas that we can't solve with just e-voting. And I have to tell you, we're at time, because um, I know this conversation, I would love to go have it for the rest of the afternoon. I want to highly encourage you all, these are people that are located here in Washington, experts in their fields. Please reach out to them if this is a topic that's interesting to you. And a reminder that about six months from now uh, is IGF USA, where we have a very similar uh, style discussion. It's going to be at CSIS, and um, there's information on that on, on all the social media feeds. Or ask me, and I'd be happy to get you information. Thank you all for attending. Really appreciate it.